Good morning, everyone. Dr. Morgan here. So I'm going to do a quick overview of the four waves of feminism. If you thought there were just three, you weren't wrong. <laughs> we're in fourth wave now, arguably. Okay, so let's just get right into it, okay? Um, so here's, let's do it this way. First wave. First wave of feminism has really specific dates. And that's kind of interesting because the other waves don't really. So first wave feminism, the dates are 1848 to 1920. Can you tell me or can you, you can't actually tell me. So can you think of why those are the dates? Maybe you've guessed 1920 is when, because women got the right to vote, right? Women got the right to vote that year, okay? Um, suffrage was amended. 1848 was the Seneca Falls Convention. Seneca Falls, and I know my handwriting is terrible, so I say, a, I repeat a bunch of times when I write something down. So 1848 was the Seneca Falls Convention. It's all the, the sort of cool, but crusty old white ladies that you know from high school. It's Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, Lucretia Mott, Susan B. Anthony, okay? It's all, it's all those women, and they uh, had Seneca Falls. So first wave feminism has a lot of vocabulary on it. So just keep taking notes as we're going because there's a lot, there's a lot of vocabulary words here. So first wave feminism is definitely all about suffrage. And suffrage, of course, is fighting for the right to vote. However, we have to backstep a little bit and think about why women had to fight so hard to get the vote. Why is it that women weren't seen as having the capacity to engage in political discourse? Why, right? So if you're a suffragette, it's the women who were fighting, right? Suffragettes. If you were a suffragette, why were you fighting so hard? And part of that, the main reason for that is because of biological determinism. Biological determinism. And biological determinism says that you were determined as a person by your biology. So what does that mean, right? How do I, how do I navigate that? Okay, so I do have biological components. I'm a cis female, I use she, they pronouns, but I was assigned female at birth. I identify most often, not always as a woman. Um, so as a non, but as a non-trans person, I'm a cis person. And so therefore I have a uterus. I have the capacity to give birth, um, my uterus. And so what does that mean about me? It means my biology says, if you have a uterus, right? If you have the parts to biologically be a female, then that means you give birth. And if you give birth, it means that you then, in society, have a specific gender role. So my biology have a uterus, that means I have to become, in the 1800s or 1900s, a stay-at-home mom. It means I have to, right? That's the argument. So if... I have a uterus, then I shouldn't go have the vote. What? Right? <laughs> what? So here's the thing. This is called pseudoscience. Pseudo. Pseudoscience. And pseudoscience said that my uterus controls my brain. <laughs> And maybe sometimes it does, right? PMS sure feels like, <laughs> right? Menopause sure feels like my body is controlling my brain, right? Like that's real. We are, we in gender studies, when I say we here, it's gender studies. We in gender studies don't say that there's no biological difference between the genders, right? Yes, or sexes. Yes, we understand that um, 
if you're assigned woman at birth, it means you have a vagina, you have a uterus, you know, you'll get breast, et cetera. Males have penises, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. There's nobody's disputing the biology of it. What we in gender studies are arguing is that the biology shouldn't then determine my social role. My biology shouldn't then determine my worth. Because I have a uterus, it shouldn't affect my mind. It shouldn't mean that I can't vote, right? I can PMS and vote cogently, right? I can be going through menopause and still be the president of the United States. Like these two things, why have we been taught that these two things are, right? Incompatible. Hillary Clinton, all the jokes about, oh, she's gonna PMS and push the atom bomb button, right? All those really old fashioned jokes. You think the orange Cheeto wouldn't have pressed the atom bomb button? That can't blame that on PMS, right? So there's a lot of things happening here um, that we still believe that we're like still navigating, that we're still believing, okay? So biological determinism says that my biology determines like who I am. And the reason women had to fight so hard for the vote is because they were essentialized essentialized is a really big gender studies word. They were essentialized by that one characteristic. So essentialism is that you see somebody or something as essentially one characteristic and you don't see all the other things about them. You don't see any other component. You just essentialize that person by one thing. So women pre, you know, whatever, and even now, were essentialized by their biology. And because of their body parts, it was seen that they were incapable in their minds of overcoming their physical limitations. I give birth, therefore, that's my essential characteristic. It's when people say things like, don't worry your pretty little head about that, right? Don't you worry about that. I'll take care of that. Don't you worry, you know, dad will take care of it. Your husband will take care of it. Don't you worry, right? Don't you worry about that little, little sweet girl, right? We're being essentialized by that one characteristic, weakness, frailty, delicacy. Well, that sounds like oysters and being delicate, right? by being incapable, so sensitive, so emotional, that we can't also like handle voting a ballot, that we can't also handle, I can't be sensitive, thoughtful, empathetic, and run a company, right? Those, they're seen, that's essentialism. You only get one thing. You're essentialized by one characteristic, okay? So because of this, society in the 19th century split men and women. It was really gender segregation, but it wasn't as literal as racial segregation. There weren't signs and stuff, but it was called the public and private sphere. And in the public sphere, you guys can see that. In the public sphere, we have, of course, men, right? Men are in the public sphere. They're dealing with capitalism, right? They're dealing with money. Uh, they're dealing with the, the world and all its dirtiness and corruption and you know all the things that the public world contains. Um, it's just a lot, right? The sort of hecticness of it, um, the aggression that's supposed to be in the public sphere. And as we know from living in Philadelphia, it is aggressive driving out the public sphere, <laughs> right? So all of these things, that's the public sphere. 
what then is the private sphere, right? Not sphere, sphere. What then would the private sphere be? What then would men, when they're all the men going out into this aggressive external world, what then do they want, right? It's a patriarchy, remember? Right? This is reinforcing the patriarchy. And remember, patriarchy is not just a system, a hierarchy of male domination. It's also a socio-political system that hurts men as much as women, if not more so. Um, quote, bell hooks. Bell hooks and understanding patriarchy. So men are out dealing and reinforcing and creating and supporting the patriarchy. Men are in control. They're the bosses, right? They have to put on these fronts. I'm a man, I'm a man, I'm a man, right? So what then happens in the private sphere? The private sphere is run by women. They become the angel in the house. The angel in the house. The angel in the house has multiple characteristics, namely piety, meaning like uh, religious, like piety, purity, right? Piety, domesticity, domesticity, being domestic, cooking, cleaning babies. Yeah, cooking, cleaning, and having babies. No, don't cook and clean your baby. <laughs> don't cook the baby. Domesticity, cooking, cleaning, having babies. Purity, right? That's the idea that women can't cheat. Men can always have a wife and a girlfriend, but like women should never be the girlfriend. <laughs> Where are these girlfriends coming from? Um, they have to be pure. They should be virgins. It's why women wear white on the wedding day. Um, it's um, why women get walked down the aisle by their fathers and literally handed over to their husbands. It's a transfer of property. And that's also why women and from the day, back in the day, were changed, their last name changed. Um, because it was a transfer of property from your husband to your, from your father to your husband. Okay. It was a legal binding agreement. And so the names were all changed. Um, right. It was a kind of um, business deal. And so the last one is submission. So submissiveness, submissiveness. So this is where um, we get the idea, people use the Bible a lot. They sort of wield phrases from um, religious books, from social texts, um, saying things like, um, you know, a woman is second to her husband. She should obey, um, things like that. A lot of people now take out obey in their, in their wedding vows, <laughs> rightly so. Um, but this is where this comes from. So the men would leave the public sphere and want to come home to this angel in the house, to this beautiful, perfect, submissive, what can I get for you? What do you need? Let me subsume myself. I'm just going to, I'm going to kind of dissolve um, as a human being with any wants and needs of my own and become what you need me to be. I'm going to pop out kids. Remember, there's not really birth control. So every time you'd have sex, you'd have a baby. Um, so women are just constantly tied to children. Um, and, you know, there's no better way to lock a woman down than just keep getting her pregnant, right? Um, it's exhausting. <laughs> I have kids, it's exhausting. So with all this happening and the public-private spheres, this biological divide between men are strong, men have testosterone, and women are weak, women are emotional, and the, the positivity with correlated to men, the negativity correlated to women. The question becomes, why on earth would we give women the vote, <laughs> right? If this is your cultural historical contextualization for the 19, 1900s, of course you're gonna be like, 
no, women can't handle the vote. They've been sitting at home, popping out 27 kids. Um, they have uteruses that control their brains. Like if this really is your thinking, then you wouldn't want to give women the vote, right? You've just made them like imbecile, incompetent babies. <laughs> yeah. So women not being allowed to go to college, not being allowed to have a bank account of their own, not being allowed to engage in any adulting behaviors really were positioned like with children, you know, like the women and children go over there and the men go over here, right? So it took a lot. It took a lot for women to go into the public sphere and protest and be like, listen, I can vote. <laughs> I don't, my brain doesn't fall out when I have my period. My brain doesn't fall out. People thought their, that people's uteruses would fall out if they rode horses, if they rode bikes. It was so insane, um, the pseudoscience that existed at this time. So it took a lot for women to go out and be suffragettes and really protest and, and be activists, really hardcore activists in the public sphere where they were not allowed, okay? The other thing that's incredibly important, I'm sorry for the weird close-up. I'm gonna move to the other end of the board. This is so low tech. <laughs> and it's a chalkboard. Can you believe I had to go look for chalk? Who has chalkboards anymore? <sighs> okay, so the last thing about um, first wave feminism, once we have, right, we have all this to consider, once we get there, the other part is the racism part. So the thing about feminism that a lot of people don't like, well, the first thing is probably this idea of like hairy armpits, no bras, um, ball busting, man hating, right? That's the, the, the number one stereotype about why people hate feminists, many women included. The second sort of reason that people tend to dislike feminism is because it's really racist, <laughs> it just is. Um, and so we need to confront that in order to transform it, yeah? So one of the big words, one of the key, key words in feminism is intersectionality. Intersectionality, and believe it or not, this actually starts in first wave feminism. It's this inter the concept of intersectionality is really um, historical and old and important. Okay, so intersectionality—that's what that says. I'm sorry, intersectionality. So essentialism, remember, says that I'm one thing, and a standard binary, a standard binary says you can only be by two things. And you're in that box and you stay in your box, right? And you fill out forms and you check a box. I'm black or I'm white. You can't be mixed on these forms, yeah? I'm gay, I'm straight. You can't be bi on these forms. Um, or pan, right? You can't be anything except whatever they give you. In this case, we're talking about just um, like very historical antiquated gender. So what are we going to look at? Male, female, right? So male, female, you check a box. This doesn't leave room for people who identify who are intersex, people who identify as non-binary. You know, it doesn't leave room for anything, right? There's no continuum on which to exist. The binary is you are one thing or the other and you only get two. That's why it's binary, right? Five. So this is gender, right? For intersectionality, we also then have to deal with the fact that remember, turn of the century, and obviously before that, there was African slavery, there was Native American slavery, there was white indentured servitude, there was a lot of class issues, like the really rich and the really poor, <clears throat> there was no real in between. So you had to choose a box. Right, you just had to choose. And this is a longer 
talk about like how you were forced to choose black or white is a much longer essay or video about um, the one drop rule about segregation, about Jim Crow laws, fugitive slave laws. And I, I'm not going to get into that here because we're just doing the waves of feminism. But if that's interesting to you, please look that up, the one drop rule. And it's what forced people to identify um, as a person of color um, or not, but often force them as a person of color because then they would be enslaved, right? So intersectionality says this binary is bullshit. This like is not possible. It doesn't work that way. So the person who first mentioned this that I'm aware of is Sojourner Truth. And Sojourner Truth said <clears throat> in her very famous speech, Ain't I a Woman, right? That quotes, it's the title, Ain't I a Woman, very famously said, I, as a Black woman, I am as strong as any man. I lift as much. I work as hard. And funnily, she said, I eat as much. It's kind of cute moment. She said, but I don't get the pay of that. I don't get the pay of a man. I don't get the respect of a man. I don't get anything. That's my gender, right? It's the sexism, she said. The other part, she says, is I'm also not allowed womanhood. I'm also not helped into carriages like white women are. I'm also not allowed to even keep my children because they were sold off into slavery, like really, she was born enslaved. So all of the things that women are supposed to be, the angel in the house, delicate, pure, um, fragile, emotional, black women were not allowed access to any of that, right? It wasn't a woman characteristic, it was a white woman characteristic. Black women, especially even now, arguably, right? Let's keep that in our minds. But way back in 1900, and of course, before that, during um, in Black enslavement in the United States, they weren't allowed to be fragile or weak or cry or, um, you know, be soft, be vulnerable, be anything. They're getting trigger warnings. They're getting raped by the, the slave owners. They're getting beaten and attacked by the slave owner's wives, right? All these mixed race kids are showing up on the pl whatever plantation and the wife knows, the wife knows her husband is raping the slave women. And this bee doesn't do anything about it because she's protecting her private sphere. She's looking out, the white woman is looking out for her own interests, yeah? just like she did in 2016, right? So white women aren't voting with their sisters of color. They're voting with white men in order to keep not only their power in the patriarchy, but their white privilege. And Sojourner Truth in 1850 called that shit out. So she said, I'm as strong as any man, and I'm a mother just like any other woman. But I don't get props. I don't get rewards. I don't get thoughtfulness around either one of these. So that, my loves, is intersectionality. It's gender, always gender, right? Because it's gender studies term. So always it's gender. In this case of Sojourner Truth and later on Kimberly Crenshaw, is the one who really took up this term, who created Sojourner Truth did not say intersectionality is a word. That was Kimberly Crenshaw. So she took up this gender and race. She's saying, I can't separate my gender from my race. I'm not allowed to be seen as equal to a man. I'm also not allowed access to womanhood the way womanhood is defined in the 1850s into the, you know, now, 
right? So black women are at this intersectionality where they're multiple things at one time. They're black and female and Audre Lord, queer added onto that, right? Or Muslim added onto that, Jewish, anything you want. The intersection, it gets more, right? Working class, upper class, um, race, religion, sexual orientation, right? Anything you wanna add into intersectionality is cool. Uh, identities can have 20 million parts to them, but at the core it's gender and race. Okay. That's where it comes from. It's like beginnings where gender and race. Okay. So what's really important to remember with all of this first wave is that not only were all women essentialized by just their biological functioning that led to their gender role and their second class citizenship in society, but mostly white women, but plenty of black women like Sojourner Truth and black men, W.E.B. Du Bois was one of the first black male like out feminists, really cool. You can also Google that. Tons of people were saying, this is denigrating. Women are not second class citizens. They need the vote. 1920, they get the vote. And white women are like, we're done with that. And they left all the other issues happening with intersectionality. Uh, Civil War, 1861 to 1865. Oh, race, that's done. Slavery is illegal. We're done with that. Okay, race is over. Oh, women got the vote, 1920. That's over. So what happens to first wave feminism, it's that it accomplishes so much but it leaves a lot of people behind. And once the movement is sort of over, boom, we get the vote, then it's done, right? So we leave a lot behind, all right? Lots of vocabulary words, lots happening. Um, and now we're gonna do part two, second wave. Thank you.